This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Early last month, on February 4th, we were asked to make a presentation to the Kenai Peninsula Borough Assembly Finance Committee regarding the state's current fiscal situation. We previously have published a copy of the slide deck we used in making the presentation at our slide share page, but thought, for those interested, we would provide a copy as well of the video of the presentation. The presentation begins with a brief introduction by Finance Committee Chair Brent Hibbert, and then proceeds from there. Mr. Brad Keithley, and he is with Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Mr. Keithley, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate, uh, I appreciate the invitation. I appreciate uh, the time uh, that you've provided for me, and I will try to make it uh, productive. Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets uh, really comes out of some early 2010 or early 2010 uh, papers that Dr. Scott Goldsmith of the Institute of Social and Economic Work Research at the University of Alaska did uh, during that time period. Scott did a series of papers uh, calculating what he called the maximum sustainable budget that Alaska could afford uh, based upon its assets and its revenue streams and was one of the uh, early uh, uh, observers that identified that Alaska, even then you could see in the early, in the early t uh, 2000 teens, that Alaska was headed toward a fiscal crisis. I remember a paper that Scott did in 20, 2009 uh, for um, uh, Shell in connection with their OCS efforts that predicted by 2020, uh, Alaska would have blown through its revenues and would be facing either PFD cuts or taxes. Um, and if you look back at those papers, they were, they're, they're a great resource in identifying um, where we were then and sort of the track we were on and, and how we might get, to, might get to that effort. About that same time as I was reading the papers and working with Scott, um, I realized that Alaska uh, really didn't have uh, an advocate, an, a non-governmental advocate, if you will, for uh, fiscal responsibility and, and fiscal uh, issues. When you look to D.C., you've got groups like uh, 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 the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, uh, the Concord Coalition, uh, the Peter G. Peterson Foundation, all of whom are sort of identified under the, under the rubric of budget hawks that, uh, from an independent standpoint, analyze fiscal issues and, and, and analyze the, the situation that the government, that the U.S. is facing and identifying uh, uh, ways forward uh, that the... Um, that the ways forward that the uh, that the U.S. should be going to to deal with its fiscal issues, we haven't really had that. We didn't really have that in Alaska. We have legislative finance, which is sort of like the uh, Congressional Budget Office, the equivalent of the Congressional Budget Office. We have the Governor's Office of Management and Budget, which is like the the U.S. Uh, the Executive Branch's Office of Management and Budget. But it, we really didn't have a group. We really don't have an activity like. Uh, we really didn't have an activity like the Coalition for the Federal Budget, for a Responsible Federal Budget, or the Concord Coalition, uh, looking at these things from a non-governmental standpoint. So the combination of of that, um, uh, Scott's work, and uh, and I was uh, in the fortunate position where I was able to wind down my career of 35 years as a lawyer and sort of looking for other things to keep my brain busy, uh, led to the formation of the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, in 2012. And since that time, uh, working with um, uh, others, uh, economists and others, we've tried to identify fiscal issues that the state's facing and identify alternative ways, ways forward uh, with respect to those issues. So I appreciate the opportunity to present to the committee and to uh, uh, the, the, uh, appreciate the opportunity to, re re to present to the assembly tonight um, sort of our view of where we've been uh, in the Alaska's fiscal situation and uh, and where we're headed, uh, the options and some things about the options that uh, that I don't think get talked about enough and, and should be talked about. Um, so as I said, where we've been, where we're, we're headed, what are the options, what's the impact of the various options on the Alaska economy and families, and frankly, I think that bullet is probably the most important bullet that I'll cover today. And then I want to talk a little bit about uh, one of Governor Dunleavy's uh, uh, proposals that was contained in the Office of Management and Budget's 10-year uh, plan uh, submitted this last December that I think is a, is a good starting point for a discussion about where we go forward. 
Where we've been, uh, most of us know uh, that, we've, uh, that we're facing a fiscal crisis. All of us know that we're facing a fiscal crisis. Certainly this borough assembly knows that we're facing a fiscal crisis. But sometimes it's good to remind us of how big a fiscal crisis uh, uh, it is. Um, starting the decade, we were in pretty good shape. This is the 2010 to 2019 taking out, taking, uh, out of uh, legislative finance uh, division sources. Um, starting in 2010, we were ahead of the game. Uh, revenues, which is, is the blue line, uh, were, uh, were exceeding uh, uh, spending, which is the red line. And the green dotted line is, is the view from the fall 2009 uh, UGF uh, revenue forecast, the fall revenue sources book that year, of where we were then anticipating, where uh, the administration was then anticipating we were headed. Uh, some uptick in, uh, in revenues going forward, um, but, but relatively flat uh, along the revenue line. What happened was anything but that. Um, from 2010, fiscal year 2010, to fiscal year uh, 2012, uh, oil prices exploded, uh, revenues, state revenues exploded, um, and we had a fairly good start uh, to the decade. But by 2013, uh, you could see the revenues were starting to fall. We didn't know how far they would fall. I remember giving a presentation at one point, um, guessing that maybe $90, uh, as, we were, as we were coming off the $120 mark, maybe $90 is where we were going to end up. Of course, as we all remember, we ended up down around the $40 range. Uh, but by 2013, revenues were uh, uh, starting to fall uh, and continued to fall uh, dramatically after that. Spending didn't. Uh, spending uh, reached its high in uh, fiscal year 2013, uh, roughly at the $8 billion uh, level. Uh, and then it started to fall also, but not anywhere near uh, as fast as, uh, as revenues uh, were falling. During the course of, and, and, and the way we made that up during the course of the, the 20 teens uh, was through drawing on reserves, uh, the fiscal reserves that we'd built up. In 2013, we kicked in the, the statutory budget reserve that had been built up in the late uh, uh, 2000s, uh, 2007, 2008, um, and we started kicking in and drawing down the statutory budget reserve. 2015, we started drawing down the, the constitutional budget reserve, uh, and in 2017, we started diverting PFDs from the statutory from their statutory amount, uh, a taking a portion of that and diverting it over to the uh, to the general fund. All told for the decade uh, through uh, 2020, estimated for uh, 2020 looking to the end of this fiscal year, uh, we've drawn down $12 billion from the Constitutional Budget Reserve. We've drawn down $5 billion, $5.4 billion from the Statutory Budget Reserve, and we've diverted $3.2 billion from the PFD, from uh, the statutory amounts of the PFD, and, and diverted that into the general fund. All told, uh, during this decade, we've taken $20.6 billion uh, in either uh, reserves or in diversions um, and diverted them into supporting the spending levels uh, that we've had. That's where we've been. Where we're headed is not a whole lot better um, based upon current law. This uh, chart is taken from uh, OMB's 10-year plan published in December as part of the governor's budget, um, and it shows several things. The dotted line at the top, um, uh, the red, uh, the maroonish or purplish dotted line at the top, shows spending levels if we stay on generally the historic uh, trend of, uh, of, of how spending has risen over the past 10, 15, uh, uh, 20 years. Um, and that shows uh, a continued rise in spending, um, a significant rise in spending, and, um, and, and far outstripping revenues. Revenues, uh, statutory revenues, current revenues uh, under current law are in blue um, at the bottom. The next line down is probably the most important line. That line uh, shows, and that line, the, 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 this shows the numbers in OMB's uh, presentation from 2021 to 2030. The last column at the end is an average over that 10-year time. So that's not that's not 2031 where it dips back down. That's just the average over the uh, over the 10 years. So that shows that the the next line, the one that ends in 4.961, uh, 
um, in, in the average, the maroon line, the solid maroon line, um, is, the, is current spending plus inflation. We hear a lot about people saying, well, we ought to cap spending at, uh, at, 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 current, at spending levels plus inflation. That's that line uh, taken from the, uh, from the OMB presentation. And as you can see, that line outstrips revenues by quite a bit. The red bars are, is the deficit, the deficit between current revenues under current law, um, projected revenues under current law, and the uh, inflation, the, the spending plus inflation line. Um, and that's what, the, that's what the red is. And as you can see, it starts uh, 1.6 uh, for 1.5 for, for 2021. People sort of gasp when I say this, but it's going to get worse. This is, this is sort of the, 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 the good part of, of the deficits. Uh, by 2030, uh, again, escalating spending by inflation and, again, using the current revenue uh, forecasts, uh, we have a deficit of 1.9 billion, r roughly two billion dollars, um, uh, in 2030. The average over the period, over that period, is uh, is 1.84 um, billion. So, uh, on the left hand side, I've I've done those averages. Spending averages over the period 4.96 billion, roughly five billion, and that's spending plus inflation. That's the average over the 10 year period. Revenues average over the period at 3.12, a deficit of 1.84. Uh, billion per year. Uh, that's that that 37 percent is is the percent of spending that's in deficit. That's the gap we have um, uh, as a percent of spending uh, averaged over that period. The total projected deficit over the period is just 1.84 times 10. It's 18 18 billion dollars. So you compare that to the the 20 billion dollars that we that we've gone through in terms of rever reserves and diversions uh, the last 10 years. We're not doing a whole lot better. Uh, as we sit here in uh, at the beginning of fiscal year 2021, uh, looking forward over the next uh, period. So the question is, what are we going to do about that? I mean, we don't have the same level of reserves. Uh, the, st the, st the statutory budget reserve will be gone this year. The constitutional budget reserve is down to less than $2 billion. Um, and PFD diversions are, has, has been our preferred approach. What are we going to do about this deficit that's sitting there out there in front of us. And the governor's 10-year um, uh, plan that if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. I highly recommend you reading. There are three documents I'll refer to here uh, in this presentation that if you haven't read, I highly recommend you read. Uh, this is the first. The governor's 10-year plan lays out essentially six scenarios because he divides scenario uh, four into two scenarios. And and they, they each take um, uh, a... Uh, an approach. One is uh, scenario one is is fixing it all by spending cuts, and scenario one in the governor's budget shows what it would take uh, to bring spending down to uh, uh, revenues. Uh, basically, it's cut 37 percent out of the budget uh, over the next uh, 10 years. Uh, the second is filling it by taxes and 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 what it would take in terms of taxes. The third is PFD cuts, the level of PFD cuts that it would take. Scenario four is drain savings, uh, drain, uh, uh, first drain the remainder of the CBR, then start draining the earnings reserve account of the PFD, which essentially is a tax on future generations because all you're doing is, is reducing the investment base uh, for the permanent fund. In the permanent fund, roughly 45 to $50 billion is in the principal, the remainder is in the earnings reserve. If you start draining the earnings reserve, then you're draining the investment base, uh, the combined investment base of the of the uh, permanent fund, um, and so scenario four is draining reserves and then taxes uh, at the end of that, or draining savings uh, and then ERA draws uh, at the end of that in order to fill the fill the remainder, and then scenario five I'll spend a few moments on uh, at the end of this is what the governor is what the OMB plan calls balanced, which is sort of an all of the above approach of how to deal with, uh, with these deficits. There's one thing that, that, I, that doesn't get enough focus that I, I do want to bring to your attention and, and ask you and others who think about this issue at the state level uh, to focus on. All options aren't the same. It, you can't say, people are good about listing the options. Oh, we can have taxes or we can, or we can cut spending or we can uh, cut the PFD or we can do this or we can do that. Uh, each of those options has a different impact on the Alaska economy and Alaska families. 
And here's the other two documents that if you haven't read, I highly recommend you read to, to really understand what's going on. The first is from ICER, the Institute of Social and Economic Research. It's a 2016 study uh, that uh, uh, Gunnar Knapp and others at ICER did uh, at that time that assessed the income and jobs effect of, of various revenue generating measures, uh, taxes, PFD cuts. Uh, the taxes they looked at were sales taxes, income ta well, two different types of sales taxes, income taxes, two different types of income taxes, a statewide property tax, and PFD cuts, and assessed the impact uh, of both on, on both income and jobs of those various revenue measures. Second study is a study done um, for house finance uh, in 2017 uh, by uh, a DC group, uh, the Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy. Uh, and they looked at the distributional effects of each of these revenue options. And by distributional effects, uh, uh, what you mean is the effect on each income bracket. What's the effect on, top, on, on, on the top 20%? What's the effect on middle income uh, families? And what's the effect on uh, lower income families? So there, you're looking at the, the effect uh, distributed across the various income brackets. It's not all the same. The effect of one of, of, one of these steps on on somebody in the top 20% is not the same as the effect on somebody in the, in the middle 20% or in the, in the low 20%. And so the, the ITEP study looks at the distributional effects. Um, these studies both come, are, are fairly detailed. They both have a, a great deal of numbers in them that I, that I find and we've found in our work uh, uh, very useful. Uh, on the left-hand side is sort of the summary chart uh, that ICER did in 2016 of various of the options. Um, and the, the revenue measures are below that first block, the income tax progressive, income tax flat rate, sales tax more exclusions, sales tax less exclusions, property tax and dividend cuts. And it shows the impact uh, per um, uh, $100 million, I believe, yeah, $100 million of, uh, of reduction or, or revenue generated by that, what the effect is on uh, the, the income, Alaska income, and the effect on Alaska jobs. I don't mean to walk through these one by one. You can do that on your own. But I want you to know the data is there. So when you start thinking about these various options, you know you can go someplace and find at least first order data about the, the effect on jobs and the effect on income uh, statewide. On the right hand is the, is the analysis that ITEP did in 2017 by income bracket of, of various options. And, 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 and this to me is, is, is very revealing. Um, you look at that chart and you'll notice immediately on the left-hand side a red bar that goes up to 7.2% far exceeds the impact of any of the other uh, options. That is the impact on the bottom 20% of PFD cuts. It takes 7.2, they analyzed in 2017, it takes, it's, a, it's effectively a 7% 7, 7 tax rate uh, per 500 million. They did it in $500 million increments per 500 million of revenue, it's a 7% tax rate on the, uh, on the lowest 20%. If you look on the right, you can see the red bar is 0 0.4. That's the impact of PFD cuts, the effective tax rate of PFD cuts on the top 20%. So you're seeing a significant distributional uh, uh, difference uh, between the impact of PFD cuts, and it goes through all the other options, but, but between the impact of PFD cuts on the top 5% compared to the, to the bottom 20%. And let me show you how that sort of plays out in their analysis using PFD cuts as an example because that's the revenue measure that we've relied on for the past few years to fill, to fill, the, to fill the deficit. This is the ITEP analysis, the 2017 analysis, uh, looking at the effect, the distributional effect of, uh, of, of PFD cuts. And again, the red bar, the, the chart on the left is the effect by income bracket uh, of, of, of the PFD cuts. And, and you can view these as effectively as tax rates because this is the rate of the income uh, by income bracket that PFD cuts are taking. Uh, for, for, and this is per person, um, uh, uh, not per family. We've done a chart that you, that's available on our website uh, that does it by representative family. Uh, Alaska, the uh, average Alaska household is 2.81 individuals and we've sort of calculated it out per household. But this is done per person, and it's showing that, that at the, at the lowest, lowest 20%, again, you've got the 7.2% tax rate, uh, of 
effectively what uh, what PFD cuts are doing. Uh, the middle 20% is the third bar to the right, or uh, from the from the left is the third bar over. It's a 2.5% tax rate on the middle 20%. By the time you get to the top uh, the top 1%, it's a 0.2% tax rate. Um, and the conclusion that ITEP reached on this was uh, was was common sense. Reductions in the PFD, and, and this is a quote from their study, from their 2017 study, reductions in the PFD are steeply regressive, having a far larger impact on families with lower incomes. Figure 5 demonstrates that while a $784 cut to the PFD payout could free up approximately $500 million for Alaska ju uh, Alaska's budget, that, would ga that gain would come at a high cost for Alaska's most vulnerable residents. The impact, going to the bottom, the impact on the bottom 20% of earners at 7.2% of income is nearly 10 times as large as the impact faced by the top 20% uh, at 0.8% of income. One of the things we focused on uh, coming out of Scott uh, Goldsmith's early work is not only the effect on the overall economy of various options, but the effect on Alaska families. And, and to understand the effect on Alaska families, what we're doing to Alaska families with these rev various revenue options, you have to do it by a distributional uh, analysis. You can say the, the effect on the median family is X, but you have to break that, to really understand what you're doing to families, you have to break that down by income bracket and see what you're doing to low income brackets, middle income brackets, and high income brackets. The ICER study does the same thing from the standpoint, uh, as I said, from the standpoint of effects on jobs and uh, statewide income. And again, focused on the PFD to give you an example of, of how ICER analyzed these things and, and also because it's the tool we've used uh, since 2016, uh, ICER's conclusion with respect to, and again, th they looked at two different types of income taxes, progressive income taxes, two different types of sales taxes, a statewide property tax, and looked at PFD cuts. And their conclusion was the impact of the PFD cut falls almost exclusively on residents, has the high and is highly regressive, so it has the largest adverse impact on the economy, not just on Alaska families, but PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on the economy per dollar of revenues raised. Um, there's really two things about the PFD cut, using the PFD cut as an option that has an effect. One is uh, you're only taking money from Alaskans. Sales taxes, income taxes, even property taxes would bring in money from out of state to help us fix our problem. Sales taxes would bring it in through tourists. Um, uh, uh, income taxes would bring it in through non-resident uh, workers uh, uh, bringing a portion of their income. The PFD is unique in that it only takes money from Alaskans. It doesn't bring in any outside money to, to help, us with our, uh, help us with our issues. And as a consequence of that, it has the largest adverse impact uh, on, on the economy because all you're doing is taking money from Alaska. You're not bringing in out-of-state money uh, to, help, uh, to help deal with the issue. The other is because it has such a huge effect on middle and lower income Alaska families, they're the ones, frankly, who spend uh, a, a, almost 100% of their income. The top 20% earners save a lot of their income. It's not going back into the economy. When you take money out of a middle and lower income Alaska family, that's money they're not going to spend. When you take money out of a top 20% Alaska family, it's really taking money out that they're likely to have saved or they're likely to have spent out of state. So those two factors uh, have, weigh heavily when you, when you assess the economic impact of the various options. And again, ICER's conclusions, 20, 2016, was PFD using the PFD cut has the largest adverse impact on the Alaska economy uh, of any of the options. Uh, one uh, uh, final uh, uh, quick slide to sort of bring this together. This is the governor's uh, scenario five, which the governor calls a balanced approach. Now remember, the, he went through the OMB, goes through various scenarios, spending cuts only, taxes only, PFD cuts only, drain savings, uh, and the balanced approach. This is the balanced approach. And basically what this does is say, we're, is, is propose or analyze or suggest or look at uh, and all of the above option. It's sort of a third, a third, a third. Again, looking at the, at the what, what I've now used as a dotted line um, on this chart, uh, uh, not the top line, but the, but the dotted line that has the numbers, that is spending plus inflation over the next 10 years. That's the same line as we had in the previous slide of spending plus inflation. And it shows, um, it, 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 it comes from the same 
deficit. It shows starts with the same deficit as the uh, as the earlier slide of a billion eight uh, averaged over the the course of the year. It fills that billion eight, satisfies that deficit in the following ways. It restructures the PMV uh, the the PFD from its current statutory approach to what the governor calls, what OMB calls POMV 5050. That takes the, the, the annual draw from the PFD or from the permanent fund that's authorized by Senate Bill 26 and divides it 50% between citizens and 50% uh, between the state. The current statutory approach, frankly, is 67, when you look at it that way, it's 67% to citizens and 33% to citizens. This brings it down to 50-50 uh, based upon that uh, statutory draw, and that adds back in about $700 million a year uh, to the general fund. Uh, the, the second piece of the balanced approach is additional spending reductions over the course of the, of the next 10 years, averaging about $600 million um, uh, a year in additional spending reductions. That would bring spending, if, if that was used, that would bring spending over the next 10 years from the current projected $4.9 billion, uh, which is spending plus infl inflation, down to $4.3 billion. Uh, and then the final uh, element of the balanced approach is new taxes. Governor's OMB plan doesn't specify what. It could be sales taxes, it could be income taxes, it could be uh, oil taxes, it could be uh, uh, statewide property tax if we ever were able to do that. Um, and it would, and, but in some form, filling in the, the remaining uh, $500 million gap per year uh, with, uh, with new taxes. Uh, more equitable taxes than I think the, the PFD cuts is, 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 in my, it, is what the governor has had in mind. And that totals per year, those, uh, those revenue sources total per year $1.8 billion, which brings it back into balance. Now, two things about that. One is uh, it does bring it back into balance, but there's no contribution in that to the CBR. We don't pay back the CBR at all uh, over that period, over that projection period. And so the CBR limps along at about $2 billion. That's essentially a tax on future generations. By not filling it back in, we're essentially taxing future generations. We've taken uh, uh, 12 billion out of it. We're not filling that back in. We're telling future generations, if you have a fiscal problem, too bad. We used up all that money. We're not paying it back. You're stuck with, with dealing with, with yourself. You won't have the crutch of the CBR uh, to, to fall on. So that's, uh, that's the outlook. The, the, the thing that I, I I really would leave you with is this slide, uh, the slide that shows the 10-year plan, where we're headed. We think, uh, we, we, we tend to think of these things in one-year increments. Oh, my gosh, if we can only get through this year, if we can only get through next year. This isn't a one-year problem. This isn't a two-year problem. This isn't a three-year problem. This is a permanent problem uh, that, that's facing the state. And this is the easy year uh, of, the, of the permanent problem. As this shows, it's 1.6 or 1.5 billion this year, 1.8, 1.9, keeps going up and it averages out to 1.8 over the over the next 10 years. This is a problem we have to deal with. The OMB 10-year uh, uh, plan has the various scenarios to deal with it, um, and we're going to have to do something along those lines. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate uh, the time. Thank you, Mr. Keithley. As we said, a copy of the slide deck that we used during the presentation is available at our slideshare.net page. We appreciated the opportunity to make the presentation before the Kenai Peninsula Borough Assembly Finance Committee and would welcome the opportunity to make similar presentations now or in the future uh, before other uh, local government uh, committees. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We appreciate you joining us for this presentation.